Thank you uh, for being such masochists. Uh, coming to, after lunch to what Vadim thought is most uh, you know unbearably uh, complicated topic ever. Um, so today, uh, so yesterday we did some homomorphic encryption. Today we're going to do some optimizations that take it almost all the way to fully homomorphic encryption. And then I'll give you some, uh, some actual constructions, uh, the actual construction of fully homomorphic encryption. So first I want to talk about somewhat homomorphic encryption for bounded depth circuits, which really almost means fully homomorphic encryption. You just pick the bound to be bigger than uh, what you want to evaluate. And if this works, it's kind of like fully homomorphic encryption. It's just that you have to pick the bound beforehand. You can't just keep going on forever arbitrarily. So let's uh, review uh, the Bukersky vacuum Tanothen scheme uh, based on LWE. And we're going to focus you know, a little more on the no noise problem of the scheme. So just in terms of review, here's uh, LWE again. I'm sure you know it by heart. Uh, I define it in terms of polynomials. I'm sorry, you know, I didn't define polynomials yesterday. I, I, I assume that you knew, but thank you, v uh, Vadim, for defining polynomials. Um, so uh, you have an error distribution. And basically, you want to distinguish these two distributions. One, you generate a, a uniform kind of secret key. And for mini i, you genera generate uh, an error ei in a linear polynomial which is uniform subject to the requirement that it evaluates the EI at the secret key. Okay? And in the second case, you just generate the, the polynomials randomly. So that's, that's the LWE problem. And then the somewhat homomorphic encryption scheme is just this. Uh, key generation is just that secret key S. And then uh, the public key is just a bunch of those, uh, those linear polynomials. And they all evaluate to something small and even at the secret key. And then to encrypt, you take, you know, you create a random encryption of zero as some uh, random subset sum of the encryptions of zero in the public key. And you add M to the message. And then to decrypt, you just evaluate uh, the, the polynomial, the ciphertext polynomial. Uh, at the secret key, and you get uh, the message plus something small and even, and then you just reduce mod 2 uh, to get the message. Right? And so when you look at it this way, addition and multiplication are really easy. You just add or multiply the ciphertext polynomials. Uh, you know, okay, fine. It's a little higher degree than uh, what it was initially, um, but then you just use some, some relinearization step that we mentioned yesterday to get it back down to a small linear polynomial. So we have this uh, problem with the noise um, it, uh, increasing inside the ciphertext. So what do I mean by the noise? The noise of a ciphertext polynomial is basically what it evaluates to uh, modulo Q. So we want that to be small, right? I mean, because like when we decrypt or in a valid ciphertext, it should be something uh, that decrypts to M plus something small and even. Okay. Um, but when we add and multiply, that thing that it evaluates to modulo Q increases, right? So we, we add two ciphertexts, the noise basically doubles, and when we multiply two ciphertexts, it basically squares. Okay? Um, it's not quite true because, you know, in the, in the uh, BV scheme, um, after we do a multiplication, we do the relinearization step, then adds a little more noise, but it, it adds something comparatively small. Uh, to it. So we really care about the multiplication effect, not the, not the additions. Those increase the noise faster. So in general, when we're computing some, some polynomial f over a bunch of ciphertexts, basically the noise um, sort of grows like the function applied to, to the noises of the ciphertext. Okay, so if uh, we're evaluating a d-degree polynomial, and we take as input some fresh ciphertext that have really kind of small noise that's bounded by B. 
then basically the output ciphertext will have noise something like b to the d. Okay? So it increases exponentially with the degree. So that's, that's really a problem uh, for efficiency. Uh, why is that such a big problem? Um, so, you know, for correctness of decryption, we need to give the ciphertext, they need to be sort of big enough in some sense to let the noise to kind of grow inside them, okay, so that they don't overflow and we have a decryption error. Uh, okay, so how big do they have to be? Well, first, okay, so the noise grows exponentially to the degree. And, you know, LWE just has, has the, you know, when you decrypt, you evaluate uh, at the secret key, and it's just, you know, it's just one integer, right? And so th there are a lot of different, uh, you know, coefficients in the ciphertext itself. But if you just look at the, how, how big the inter, you know, individual coefficients of the ciphertext have to be, uh, you know, to let that, the, the, you know, when you're evaluating a d-degree polynomial, to let the noise grow up to be, be b to the d, basically you need the modulus q, q to be bigger than b the, to the d. Right? Okay. So the individual coefficients are going to be really big because they look kind of random in a ciphertext. They look random modulo q. So each individual coefficient has more than d bits. Uh, and also for security, uh, you know, a big d uh, hits us there too in terms of the lattice dimension that we actually need for security. Um, so we need it to be hard to approximate basically b to the d minus 1 uh, LWE. And why is that? It's because when you start off with a fresh, you know, we have a really big Q to let the noise grow, right? But we start off with really fresh ciphertexts that have noise only B. So there's a, there's a huge gap between the size of the noise in these fresh ciphertexts and how big we're going to let it grow. A big gap between the modulus size, which is kind of like a noise ceiling, and the actual noise of the, the fresh ciphertext. And that big gap, you know, the bigger that gap is, the easier the LWE approximation problem is, you know? Uh, you know, because that's basically the size of the error versus the modulus. The bigger that gap is, the easier the LWE problem is. And in particular, um, you know, for it to be hard to b to the d basically approximate lattice problems in 2 to the k time, where k is our security parameter, we need a lattice dimension of d times k. Okay, just because there are these lattice algorithms that, um, you know, find a sweet spot. So that means that the total ciphertext length is uh, d squared, or d is the degree of evaluating, times, times the security parameter. Okay, so it grows polynomially, quadratically with the degree. And so this isn't even taking into account like all the computation that we have to do on these ciphertexts. This is just the size of the ciphertext itself. So... All right, so, so we have this thing where the ciphertext is d squared times k bits. So you could call this like a somewhat homomorphic encryption scheme for a bounded degree in some sense. So you just pick some degree that you want your scheme to be able to evaluate. And for that degree, I can give you a scheme where basically all the algorithms run in polynomial time in k and d. Okay, is that clear? So this is the, basically the best we can hope for based on the, the behavior of the noise. So wouldn't it be better if we had a somewhat homomorphic encryption scheme for bounded depth? And what I mean by that, well, first of all, I, I had this definition of leveled FHE a while back. And it's uh, just relaxation of FHE. It's just, you know, you, you decide beforehand the number of levels you want to be able to evaluate. And for that number of levels, um, there's kind of a family uh, of, of, FHE, of encryption schemes. And in particular, E sub L can you know, homomorphically evaluate circuits of depth L. Uh, all the algorithms are polynomial and the security parameter in L. And you know, the evaluation algorithm has a complexity polynomial uh, in the things that you expect, uh, K, L, and the, the, the circuit size. There's, there was one additional requirement that the decryption function 
um, is the same for all L. Just kind of a weird requirement, but it, it was basically defined that way because uh, there's this bootstrapping procedure later where we're going to actually homomorphically evaluate the decryption function of the encryption scheme. And uh, if you can just say that that decryption function is just, you know, it's a fixed circuit for, for all different L, uh, it just becomes a lot easier to sort of define uh, what's going on and to, you know, get a, you know, get a system that works. Okay, so, but today we're going to be a little humbler and, and not really call it FHE. We're just going to say it's somewhat homomorphic encryption for bounded depth circuits. Just because that's, you know, that's how I'm presenting it. This is kind of like, you know, like Vadim sort of had, you know, this is the way the encryption scheme sort of should have been invented. You know, this is kind of, my whole uh, two days is kind of like, this is how homomorphic encryption should have been invented. I mean, we should have started off with uh, the somewhat homomorphic encryption schemes, then gone here to uh, something which is, you know, pretty close to being fully homomorphic in the sense that you don't have to decide beforehand uh, how many levels you want to do. And then finally, the, the bootstrapping procedure to allow arbitrary processing. So what do we have to do to get bounded depth? Uh, well, we need to find some better way of dealing with the noise. So right now it grows exponentially with degree. Uh, wouldn't it be great if there were some simple trick that, uh, you know, you do a multiplication and then, you know, there's just some simple trick to just beat uh, the noise back down to what it uh, was initially. So you have kind of a constant, maybe a constant level of noise. And you know, of course, maybe there's some, you know, little tiny cost. Uh, I, I don't know. But um, I mean, why, why does it in inherently have to grow exponentially if the degree? I mean, there's no, no reason. So, um, so, uh, so we want b basically better noise uh, management. So uh, that way we'll get shorter ciphertext and um, uh, somewhat homomorphic encryption for bounded depth. So, so here's a crazy I idea in particular for how to beat uh, the noise back down. So suppose you have a ciphertext that encrypts M. Okay, so there's the decryption equation. And uh, it's defined sort of modulo Q. And what I want to do is I just want to pick uh, a different modulus P, a smaller modulus. And I just kind of want to scale the ciphertext down. Just multiply it by P over Q. And then I just want to sort of round that, that, uh, that ciphertext. I mean, it's not even an integer ciphertext after you scale it down maybe, but then you just kind of round it somehow. And uh, it would be great uh, if that new ciphertext, um, you know, just encrypted the message. And moreover, well, you know, under a new kind of inner modulus P. And moreover, it would be especially great if, if the noise level went down. So it's, if the noise is basically P over Q times the original noise. So what's the plan? You know, after we do a multiplication, the noise goes up, it squares. And then we, you know, we use this, uh, this modulus switching. We just scale the ciphertext down. The noise goes back down to uh, the same level as before. We can do more squarings. We, you know, we scale it back down. And we just, uh, just keep on going forever. Well, until our list of our ladder of moduli these moduli have to be decreasing until our ladder of moduli kind of hits bottom and we have to stop. But maybe we can have, you know, a polynomial number of moduli in our, in our ladder that allows us to do, evaluate polynomial depth. So that's the crazy idea. Uh, I, so, I mean, this is introduced in the, the BV scheme. It was kind of combined with uh, a relinearization step and here we're going to use it um, kind of in a different way, at, um, to in, in kind of the iterative fashion that I just uh, described. So here's the actual scaling lemma. I mean, it's like, uh, this is, I, I don't know if this really tax your brain uh, too much. Um, yeah, okay. I'll grant you that some things here might tax your brain. I, I don't really uh, apologize for it. But <laughs> so. Um, so, um, yeah, so but this, is, but this is really an elementary uh, lemma. So there's nothing, 
there's no fancy math here. It's almost, uh, if you presented this to a mathematician, you would be embarrassed, really, because it's, uh, it's so, um, but I, when you work in crypto and you find something like this, it's kind of a, a different matter. It's, it's really amazing that you can take essentially a, a cipher text and just kind of scale it down. I mean, you would never believe uh, that you could do this, but okay. Anyway, so here's the, the lemma. So, okay, so we have our two moduli uh, in, you know, Q, our initial Q and a smaller uh, modulus P. And um, what I'm saying is that, uh, so you were given a ciphertext that, uh, that encrypts uh, the message uh, under key S uh, with, with respect to Q. And uh, set C prime just to be the non-integer vector, that's just the scaling down of C. You just multiply it by P over Q. So that's kind of an, an intermediate ciphertext. It's not even an integer vector. And then you set C prime prime to be basically that, that fractional vector rounded. But it's rounded in kind of a special way. Uh, in particular, it's the, the, clo the closest integer vector to C prime, such that it's uh, equal to the initial ciphertext modulo 2. That's because my plain text space is modulo 2, and it's, that's going to uh, preserve the, uh, the encrypted value. Okay? So that's, uh, that's pretty hard to believe, but um, uh, yes. So, and I say if, uh, you know, if, if this initial noise is a little less than Q over 2, that difference from Q over 2 is not too big, so don't worry about it. Then uh, the C prime prime is a valid encryption of, of M uh, of possibly less noise, much less noise. Uh, and what the noise is exactly is, um, is yes, P over Q times the initial noise, but plus some additive value that de uh, depends, it's L norm of, of the secret key. So we saw yesterday that the secret key can be chosen to be small. Uh, according to the noise distribution. So, so we can think of the L1 norm of S as being small. So you add some small thing. But aside from that, it's, it's the noise is P over Q times the uh, size of the initial noise. Yes? So what's to prevent an adversary from just scaling down to a set of ciphertexts that they can solve? Uh, well, I mean, I, I guess... Um, Yes. I mean, it, it keeps it from going down to zero, yes. That's, I mean, that's basically it. Um, I, mean, everything is I mean, everything is public here, right? I mean, the, 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 you know, this, everything in this transformation, the Q, the P, the initial ciphertext, are all public. So this is a public, perfectly public transformation. So if you believe the LWE problem, then you believe that this transformation doesn't help you to, to break a ciphertext. Yeah, so just intuitively why it doesn't help you break it is just this, this thing that you're forced to add, you know, the additive noise. So essentially you can't go below that value. Okay. So I'll actually give you the, the proof of this. Um, since it's not a crypto proof, this might actually be the hardest, uh, hardest proof. You know, it's like... Real this is, is basically manipulation of formulas. Um, so okay. So all right. So you have your initial ciphertext, okay? And just think of that initial ciphertext. You know, it has a dot product with the secret key that's, you know, has small noise. It's uh, the dot product is really close to a multiple of Q. Right. So. All right, so the dot product is, uh, uh, the noise is the dot product minus k times q, some really small value. Now I'm just going to, if I just scale everything by p over q, I get p over q times this uh, initial noise is what? It's just uh, the dot product of c prime uh, with s because we just defined c prime to be p over q times c. I mean, we're just multiplying, you know, that's what we get when we multiply c by p over q. And, uh, and the Q in the, at the end of the equation is just, you know, changes to a P because, you know, we're multiplying by P over Q. You know, nothing complicated going on here. 
So, so when we look at the C prime vector, its dot product with S, we should just think of it as being really close to K times P if the initial dot product is really close to K times Q. So now when we look at C prime prime, C prime prime is really close to C prime. It's just a rounding. Uh, you know, since we're doing a rounding in sort of a mod two way, the difference between C prime prime and C prime is all the coefficients are between minus one and one because we're, you know, we're rounding but in a mod two way. And uh, so if you take the dot product of that difference with the secret key, it's less than the L1 uh, norm of S. Okay, so now C prime prime is, uh, is uh, you know, it's an integer vector and it's, it's really close to a multiple of K times, it's really close to K times P. If the secret key is small, which we said uh, we can do. So if you just uh, collect all this stuff, you do the triangle inequality, um, uh, you get uh, that, uh, you know, C, uh, the offset from, from P of this dot product of C prime, prime and S, it, the noise is, um, is P over Q uh, times the initial noise plus the L, L1 norm of S. And, um, and just because of the way that, uh, you know, this requirement here, uh, it just helps us say that this, this value is actually less than, than P over 2. You know, the only reason we want to say that is because we want to say that, um, let me go to the next one, that, uh, well, because, you know, this, this magnitude is less than P over P, P over 2, that means that this is actually reduced modulo uh, P. I mean, because it's in the range minus P over 2 to P over 2. So this is the actual value of uh, C prime prime uh, of the noise there. Okay, and what about the uh, actual decryption of, of this new ciphertext? We just have a lot of stuff that's congruent to each other mod 2. I mean, we have that, that um, uh, let's see. So this is congruent to, to this here, which is congruent to this modulo 2 because the C's and the C, uh, C prime prime are congruent because uh, Q and P, P are both odd. Okay, and this is uh, obviously equal to that. So we get that these two things are congruent to each other modulo 2. So we get a, a new ciphertext that's been scaled down and uh, it decrypts correctly. And the noise is smaller. Okay? Good yeah? You probably said this, but P and P are both times. Uh, they don't have to be, just have to be odd. Um, yes. And then C prime and C double prime are the same. Then I don't have this additive noise. Why are C and C prime prime the same? I mean, it's it's been scaled down. It becomes a fraction. So so C prime is an actual fraction, and then it's just kind of rounded. It doesn't preserve any of the of of. Um, I mean, the ciphertext itself is not divisible by, by, I mean, if you multiply the ciphertext by P over Q, it becomes a fraction. It's not an integer in any sense. So, yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, it's, it should be, uh, yeah, it should raise alarm bells, I, I guess, in, in a certain sense. What, what it, this, basically says is that the, mo the particular modulus is kind of irrelevant. The LWE problem is defined with respect to some Q, but you could just, you can switch between Qs. So, um, and so the particular modulus in some sense, it, really what's important I guess is its size in some sense, but aside from that, the particular modulus, you can just switch it and so it doesn't really matter. Well, the size in relation to the noise and, yeah. So, you know, I guess it's, you know, especially interesting when you, when you uh, think about what Vadim said uh, yesterday 
that for ring LWE, you really needed, you know, for the decision, uh, search to decision reduction, um, you really needed a particular kind of queue, right? You needed uh, the automorphisms to work modulo Q in this ring, and that only uh, worked for queues with a special form. But this says that you can just switch sort of, you know, willy-nilly in between uh, different moduli. So if you have one where you can't use Vadim's um, search to decision reduction, basically you, you can take that and just switch to a modulus where you can. And, and this, these LWE problems are, are, are equivalent. And you use the search to decision reduction and then you just switch back because these decision problems are the same. And, and it goes through. Uh, for that, I was, I was thinking kind of the same size. You know, if you have the same size, um, you have some, um, the noise level basically remains the same aside from an additive factor. Yeah, so you wouldn't want to, I mean, yeah, you could scale up to a larger modulus. I don't, I don't know what the point would be aside from what I just mentioned to take advantage of this reduction. Okay, so here, you know, if you enjoy actual numbers, um, you know, here's an example. Um, so, okay, so you have Q equal 127, P equals 29, you know, have some ciphertext vector and a secret key. And, you know, you take this dot products and, and you can see it's 986, I assume you can, um, it's pretty obvious. So. And then you, uh, to reduce it, um, you subtract F, you know, 8 multiples of 127, you get minus 30. Okay. Now we uh, do modulus reduction. We multiply it by P over Q. You get a 39.9 and a 48.4. You round in such a way that these numbers are, have the same parity as the original ciphertext vector. So uh, you round to 39, which is odd, like 175, and you round to 48. And you just test it. And, uh, you know, I mean, one example doesn't, you know, prove the rule, but, uh, but uh, you get that. Uh, yes, it works. So you take the dot product, it's 222. You subtract off 8 multiples of 29 just, and get to minus 10. That's the same 8 that we had before when we subtracted 8 multiples off of uh, 127. And so the noise magnitude decreases uh, from 30 to, to 10. Uh, but the relative noise actually increases. I mean, the noise is scaled down by P over Q, but you have this additive factor. So that, um, the relative noise increases a little bit. Um, so, um, so, right. Um, so anyway, so uh, I already said this, uh, you know, the secret key can be small. Uh, it can be chosen uh, with respect to the error distribution, so you don't have to worry too much about that additive term. But that is, additive term uh, is what saves us, uh, you know, like I mentioned before, from just you know scaling the noise down to zero, so that it's somehow trivially easy to break. Yeah. Uh, yeah, th that's not a planted question or anything. I'm not sure what, what you want me to want to say. Um, but <laughs> but um, what, uh, I will try to say something about that. Um, but just that um, may maybe learning with rounding is, is, is a little relevant here. So uh, Chris had this problem learning with rounding. When you learn, uh, when you do this and you just kind of round, and then you're not saying, you know, maybe the noise isn't uh, especially Gaussian when you just round. And he showed that... Um, you know, this is basically as hard as LWE, so that's, that's sort of what we're doing. I mean, we're, we're scaling down and rounding, and so maybe it's, it's I haven't really explored the relationship between uh, th this and learning with rounding, but I, I guess um, that's something to say about it. D did you have something else in mind? I'm interested. The resulting problem is not really an LWE problem. It's good for the applications you don't care about. You want to show reduction. Oh, well, okay, yeah, so you could, I mean, you could do the typical thing of drowning out this initial noise in the problem with a, 
So, so you, you lose a factor. By dr uh, drown out the initial noise with um, you know, super polynomially bigger noise and to make it Gaussian if, if you like. Or maybe you could directly go through learning with rounding. I'm not really sure. I think Chris also has some, some problem with, with, uh, with this uh, in the reduction uh, between them. Uh, so, yeah. So you lose a little bit. But. Okay. So I kind of mentioned this before, but I'll, I'll go over it again. So why, why do we care about this modulus reduction? How does it help us in particular to evaluate a circuit of depth L? Uh, so, okay, if we, want to evaluate, uh, if we want depth L, we're going to start with a really uh, uh, large modulus, Q sub L. And we're going to start with really small noise, you know, ciphertext of small noise eta. And when we multiply, the noise becomes eta squared. Okay, but okay, we're going to pick our Q uh, L minus 1 to just be a factor of eta smaller than our initial QL and we just use modulus reduction, we apply that to the ciphertext, the noise goes back down from, uh, goes down from eta squared back down to eta. And we just keep, uh, keep doing this, you know, after the next multiplication it goes back up to eta squared. But we pick our next modulus so that it's a factor eta smaller, the noise back goes back down to eta. So we just have this ladder of decreasing moduli, eta at each step, um, you know, and eventually we kind of hit the bottom of the ladder. We just need to pick our QL at the top to be big enough to allow L steps before it hits bottom. Okay? Is that, is that clear? So just to compare it to the old way of doing things, uh, so in the old way, well this is with modulus reduction. So uh, with modulus reduction, we, you know, if we want to do nine levels, uh, oh, the eta became an n somehow, but uh, okay, fine. Well, there shouldn't be an eta. Uh, we pick our modulus to be eta to the ninth, and you know, like I said, just at each level, you go to uh, a smaller modulus, smaller by a factor of eta, and eventually you hit uh, bottom, and you can evaluate eight levels, uh, you know, here. So there's some, you know, fence post uh, error type things. So on the other hand, uh, with the old method, what would happen is that okay, you start, you have, you start off with the same uh, modulus. What happens is the noise is eta. Uh, you do a multiplication, it squares. But you do the next multiplication, it doesn't go to eta to the cubed. It goes to eta to the fourth. And it's uh, increasing like crazy at this point, you know, a to the eighth, a to the sixteenth. Each time you do a multiplication, the exponent doubles, and so you run in, into trouble by the fourth level. Okay, so it's a, I mean, it's basically it's an exponential improvement from this um, crazy idea of just scaling the ciphertext down. All right. So let's explore that, just, you know, hash out the asymptotics of the performance. So, uh, yeah, if you want to evaluate depth, depth L, your largest uh, modulus is, is the, the fresh noise level to the L power. And since that's your, that's your largest modulus, the largest ciphertext, I mean, you know, Q sub L is going to be the size of the, largest, uh, size of the coefficients in the cipher, largest ciphertext. So the largest, you know, it has, it has like, you know, dimension n, and n is, you know, uh, you know, security parameter, it's polynomial in the security parameter. Really, it's the security parameter times uh, something that's, that's polynomial in this, uh, in this L value. Okay, so, so L, as L increases, it'll force us to also increase the lattice dimension a little bit for security purposes. But it'll... You know, but things will remain polynomial in L and just linear in the in the security parameter. Okay, so uh, compare that to before, where the ciphertext was, uh, you know, uh, went up in basically the same sort of way with respect to the degree, not the depth of the circuit. Okay. 
Okay, and so one cool thing about this transformation is that if you look at the final ciphertext, it's with respect to a small modulus. And, and like BV, BV did in their scheme, you can also take that, that ciphertext and apply um, key switching to it so that even the dimension of the ciphertext is, low as, is, is as low as possible, you know, um, and, and still secure. Like, you know, you remember key switching, right? So in, in key switching, basically you can take a, a ciphertext encrypted under one key and by providing some auxiliary information, you can transform it to a ciphertext encrypted under a different key. Well, that different key could have really low dimension, if, if you like, and if that's secure, uh, to provide the auxiliary information that allows that transformation to that low dimensional key. So for the final ciphertext, you can actually get it to be both low dimension and have really small modulus. Uh, because uh, the initial ciphertext is a really huge gap in between the size of the modulus and the, the, the noise is only eta, but, okay? So there's a big gap here, and since there's a big gap, for security we have to pick uh, the dimension of the lattice to be bigger. Okay, when, I mean, the, the LWE problem is, is, you know, is easier when that gap is really large. But at the end, when the modulus is really, really small, it's, it's almost, you know, just barely small, uh, the modulus is just barely bigger than the noise level. We can actually pick the dimension of, of that, that lattice to be small. Okay, so at the end we get a really low dimensional lattice under really small coefficients. And basically it looks like a normal, normal regev, non-homomorphic uh, regev ciphertext. It's it's, uh, you know, what, what I'll, I'll defer to whatever was, uh, was talked about in, in LWE encryption. It can look basically like a, a, a normal non-homomorphic reg of ciphertext. Maybe not exactly, but it's, 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 uh, it, it's, it's basically pretty cl uh, If it's not, it's very close. Um, okay. So it's a really small ciphertext, and in particular, it's completely independent in size of the circuit that was evaluated uh, to get there. So we can say that we have this, this kind of final weird property um, that we had in the level definition of level uh, fully homomorphic encryption. We wanted the decryption function to uh, be constant, it not depend on L at all. Okay. And so for this final ciphertext, when, you know, when we've done the evaluation algorithm, we've evaluated all, all the way down to the bottom of the, the ladder. For this final ciphertext, its size and decryption complexity is completely independent of L. Does that make sense? Uh, okay. uh, no. no, it doesn't get, give you circuit privacy. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything about circuit privacy, I mean, uh, but uh, so, so you can ask me anything you like about circuit privacy now, and we can get on to the important stuff. Huh? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, so I mean, again, the typical way uh, you, you uh, get circuit privacy is you have a ciphertext with some bound on the noise. And, um, and let's say the bound, say the bound on the noise, uh, there's a gap between that and the modulus that's super polynomial. Then you, you just take that ciphertext and drown out the initial noise by a super po polynomially larger amount of uh, noise. And it obs statistically obscures um, um, everything about the ciphertext. Well, that's not, uh, that's not a generic transformation. It's very um, specific to this context, you know, context of noise. And, um, but yeah, there might be some, uh, well, we had some. Uh, you can bootstrap and yeah, and, um, we haven't gotten to bootstrapping yet, but intuitively you would think bootstrapping also helps. You take a ciphertext and you apply homomorphic decryption to it. And what you get is a different ciphertext that encrypts the same value. You would think some, that some information about the previous circuit was lost, but that's it's not a proof. So. 
Okay. Um, I kind of mentioned this uh, before, so that this, the security that we get uh, from using this trick, um, you know, uh, of the ladder of moduli, uh, we, we actually get better security. So before, before we we needed, you know, to evaluate even moderately complex functions, we had to set the gap between the size of the modulus and the size of the noise to be really, really big, right? And the bigger that gap is, you know, the bigger the approximation factor of the LWE problem is, the, the less our security. And, um, and, and here, in some sense, you know, the gap is, is, is exponential in the depth, not the degree. And so, you know, assuming that for most functions the depth is, is much less than the degree, uh, what you get is security where the approximation factor is, is you know, some polynomial in K to the... To the um, to the depth, not the degree. So you actually get better security and better efficiency. It's a it's a win win win, <laughs> just like everything else in uh, in lattices. All right. So I want to mention that. Um, I mean, I, I guess you can. Uh, I, maybe this the modulus reduction trick is is, um, is it's more general than just applying to the LWE based scheme. There, uh, there's some guys um, in um, Eurocrypt 12, uh, Corona et, et al., that extend this to the integer-based scheme. So before, the integer-based scheme was uh, grossly inefficient. I mean, even more, I mean, okay, everything here is grossly, but, but you know, even more grossly inefficient than normal, the, the normal version of grossly inefficient. Um, just because the approximate GCD problem was um, not really kind of a hard problem, you had to like set per crazy parameters to make it a hard problem. Um, but, he, but they apply this modulus reduction trick, and so they get like similar be behavior where um, you know the, the parameters depend on the depth, and not de the degree, and so that helps that helps a lot with the asymptotics. I, you know, in terms of practice, I I don't know, but but um, oh yes, so all right. So that's basically it for the. Um, were, were you impressed by the modulus reduction trick and the and the simplicity, the, the perfect simplicity of uh, of um, of lattice based crypto that you just like multiply things by fractions and it all, it magically works out. Uh, I guess not. <laughs> okay. So now I'm going to uh, move on to more exciting news um, in FHE. Uh, I'm going to talk about um, batched computation on encrypted data. And basically, the, you know, if you if you feel like going to sleep, maybe uh, you know, on the next slide, uh, you can remember that um, the idea here is that each ciphertext is is basically packed with an array of plain text, and we're just going to manipulate arrays of plain text instead of having a single tiny little plain text in a big gargantuan uh, ciphertext. Okay? So, yes. So, I, as I said, ciphertexts are long, plain texts are often short, which is just wasteful, and we hate waste. So, um, and so it's pretty clear, it should be pretty clear that uh, the overhead of homomorphic encryption, and what, you know, what I mean by overhead is, is uh, the time of encrypted computation versus the time of unencrypted computation. This overhead is going to be at least as big as the, the ratio of the ciphertext length and the plaintext length, right? It's probably going to be much worse than that. So if you have really gargantuan ciphertext and really tiny plaintext, you can't really hope to get good overhead for F F F FHE. Okay? So what are we going to do? We're going to batch. So we put an array of plain text into uh, plain text slots that are wedged inside uh, each ciphertext. And uh, what we want is that when we do an addition operation on a pair of ciphertext, it has the effect of component-wise uh, adding up everything that's in the two array of vectors. And similarly for, for multiplication, just component-wise it's going to multiply the, the two arrays. 
Okay, here's just, you know, in case you didn't understand the thing with the, the fingers. Um, so I suppose you have two cipher decks that have these, these slots, and this is the content of, of their slots. You have B1, B2, B3, and those things uh, primed. What you want is, you know, add. It, 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 when, after you do the add operation, what's in the slots is B1 plus B1 prime and, and so on. Multiplication, component-wise. Um, and, of course, you want that this new operation, which magically works on arrays, rather than singletons, you want it to have the same cost uh, as the original addition operation on ciphertext. So, so, yeah, think Chinese remainder theorem. So, like, when you add two numbers modulo 15, you're implicitly adding numbers modulo 3 and modulo 5. Okay, so here's an example. Uh, this is, uh, again, uh, this is BV. Um, so suppose you just, uh, you know, transformed BV a little bit. You know, initially the plain text space is mod 2. I'm just going to make the uh, plain text space be P1 times P2 times P3. That's the only transformation here where all these uh, primes P are small. And, you know, our, our, you know, this necessitates some transformation. So encryptions of zero are now things that evaluate to something small and divisible by this product of primes. And messages are, are now taken from this space. And uh, decryption is, is, is now when you, the noise of the ciphertext is going to be the message, you know, instead of something small and even, it's something small and divisible by, by this product of primes. I mean, I've just replaced two with this product of primes. Everything is just, uh, is just the same. And, uh, okay, reduce that. So, and this is just what I said before, just by CRT, I mean, you kind of have three plain text slots here. You, you can just, when you do an encryption of a message, you have three slots that you can use. You have the P1, P2, and P3 slots. You can just, uh, you know, do the... Uh, interpolation to get the right value of M, mod P1, P2, P3. And when you do addition and multiplication, you're just implicitly separately doing computations mod P1, P2, and P3. All right. So, yeah, but that's kind of lame, right? I mean, yeah. So, uh, what we're going to do is uh, use fancy algebra. So, uh, we're going to use ring LWE. <laughs> um, and it's, uh, it's, you know, it's more, I guess it's more natural when you get used to it. Um, it certainly does a better job of batching. Does the previous thing you buy even affect? Because you're supposed to make Q bigger now for correctness. That's exactly right, yeah. Uh, uh, anything, uh, it doesn't buy much. Can you repeat the question? He asked whether it buys you anything, this previous example here I gave of just increasing the plain text space here because here in this you have to um, I mean it's kind of everything kind of scales up when you, when you go from two to the product to the primes you know the size of the mes messages scales up and the size of, of the noises um, you know is also going to kind of scale up analogously so the question is whether it buys you anything in terms of the evaluation capacity um, Yeah. Yeah, so I don't know the answer to the question, but, but it's, it's, it's my lame example, so I, don't ask me to defend it. <laughs> okay. All right, so now we're going to do fun stuff with uh, Ring LWE. And uh, Vadim went over this yesterday, and uh, I'll just review it because I, um, you know, uh, it's a little complicated. Um, so, all right, so our ring is this. And, um, you know, instead of doing things mod 2, um, uh, oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, okay, I'm thinking of P as like the, the plain text space. So initially we were doing things mod 2. Now I, I want to, you know, for technical reasons, I want to do things mod P. Okay. And uh, so I'm just defining the rings here. And suppose it is the case of this, this polynomial, which you can think of as, as x to the n plus 1. Suppose it's the case of this polynomial factors modulo p. Then what happens is that this, this ring here, the plain text space, 
uh, decomposes as a direct product. I, I don't know what the symbol for that is. Uh, as a direct product of these rings here. So, for example, if it splits into linear factors here, then you just get, you know, n different rings. It's a direct product of n different rings, where these are all linear polynomials. Okay, so this is the same example. I came up with this example without looking at Vadim's slides, but same example. Um, so, suppose you have this ring here, and, uh, you know, p equals 17. Um, then, uh, well, wh wh why did I pick this in the first place? Um, so, this divides y to the 8th minus 1, okay? So, what you want to do, so, so since it's 8, you want to pick a prime that has 8th roots of unity, okay? And um, in the order of, you know, the order mod of things modulo p is like p to the minus 1, right? So you want p, to p minus 1 to be divisible by 8. Okay, so that, that's, uh, I guess, the smallest uh, interesting case, which is uh, why you want this to be a power of 2 also. Um, so this is the smallest interesting case, which is why we both came up with it, I guess. And so, and so for the eighth roots of unity, you have, you know, just um, boring eighth roots of unity, and then you have the primitive ones. And the primitive ones are, are the ones where the order is exactly 8. It, when, you, when you exponentiate, it doesn't reach 1 until you take it 8 times. Um, and so the, the, the primitive eighth roots of unity are these numbers here. They have this nice pattern. Um, you know, why does it have this nice pattern? It's, it's because, you know, if you put something even here, then it would have smaller order, right? Because, uh, you know, the, the order is like 16. So if you put something even here, it would have, the number would have a smaller order. Okay, so these are the, the primitive uh, eighth roots of unity. Um, okay, and so, so this ring decomposes as, as a direct product of, of these smaller rings. I talked a, a little bit about, about uh, yesterday, I, I don't know if you remember, but, but how, how sort of things in this ring, when you, you take a polynomial modulo the ideal y minus 2, it corresponds to evaluating that polynomial at 2. Okay, when you reduce a polynomial modulo y minus 2, it's just evaluating that polynomial at 2. Um, so, uh, yeah. So, yeah. So, when you look at a message, or, you know, a message polynomial, you know, the messages exist in this, in this, in this ring. They're polynomials. Um, and you can really express it by its evaluations mod 2, 8, 15, and 9, which correspond to what it is in these different, uh, different rings. Okay? Sir? Yes? If it doesn't split into linear factors, um, does that mean that the quadratic factors have more storage capacity in them? Yeah, so for example, when you're, uh, when you're evaluating AES homomorphically, which, you know, um, is very dangerous. Uh, you, you might want the plain text spaces to be like uh, uh, isomorphic to be uh, to GF two to the eight, because AES operations are expressed naturally as, as in GF two to the eight, and so you can. Uh, I really didn't want to get into that, but you can uh, construct situations where, yeah, instead of factoring into linear factors, it fac factors into things of degree eight. And, and each little sub-thing here is isomorphic to GF2 to the 8. Okay. So here's our uh, ring LWE uh, base scheme, a somewhat homomorphic scheme. Um, so I'm just going to, you know, I did everything mod 2 yesterday just because it's, you know, it's easier until we get to this point. Uh, and now I want to replace it uh, with P. We're just going to take, you know, the plain text space is mod p now. Um, and everything is transformed in an obvious way. Uh, and I want this p to have uh, the special form that Vadim mentioned. It's congruent to 1 modulo 2 to the n. And that means that p has uh, n primitive 2nth two, uh, two roots of unity. Okay. 
And, and so the message space becomes this, uh, this interesting thing. It's a polynomial, but we would like to view it uh, in terms of its evaluations at those roots of unity. Okay, so let's just, um, I, I, you know, I, you probably remember this from Vadim's talk, but just, you know, just to be sure. So we're doing these manipulations on the plain text, and I just want to make sure that, I mean, so make sure you understand what's going on, right? I mean, we're adding and multiplying cipher text that's implicitly adding and multiplying plain text, and, um, and I want to look at the plain text in terms of their evaluations. And everything happens component-wise, which is you know, what I was talking about earlier. I wanted to do operations on arrays of data. So it's kind of nice. So the, you know, in terms of addition, everything is component-wise when you view it as evaluations at the different roots of unity. And same for multiplication. And OK, you want to evaluate some gnarly function. Uh, it still works. OK. Um, and so this is really nice for batching. Basically, um, you can evaluate the same function f, just fix f. And suppose you have n blocks of input that you want to evaluate f on. Then you just give, for each block, you give that block a slot. And, and you just, you know, you stick the, you know, you have kind of a rectangle of data. And you kind of, uh, you know, for each block, you stick it in a column. And then you just evaluate the whole function f. And what comes out is f evaluated on the input data uh, to each slot. In fact, I have a nice picture on the next slide. So it's, I'm not sure why I'm waving my arms. So, um, so here, you know, you, do the columns correspond to, the, to the, the slots? OK, addition, multiplication, and function f, you know, it's going to have a lot of inputs. But the, each input just kind of stays in its, its slot. It doesn't interact with the other slots. You know, an evaluation on alpha 1 doesn't interact with an evaluation on alpha 2. They stay apart, segregated. OK. So is that, um, is that clear? All right, so that's great for SIMD. Uh, operations. So simultaneous instruction, multiple data. All right. So now we're going to go, you know, take it to the next level. So we, what we did uh, so far is we had, you know, a single function, and it's it's evaluated in parallel on multiple different blocks of data. But what if we just we only have, um, you know, we only have one block of input. We only have one function. Can we tell, still take advantage of uh, SIMD type operations? And that's what we're going to try to do here. Uh, this is work with uh, Shai and Nigel. Um, so like I said, you have some, um, some circuit, some complex circuit. You just have a, you know, you have a set of data. Now if you're not doing SIMD and you, your, your, your plain texts are just singletons, we know how to handle that case. Um, you know, add and mult are a complete set of operations on singletons, so that's really good. Um, but if you look at arrays of data, add and mult are not a complete set of operations anymore. Um, wait, I haven't, I haven't asked any questions. So, so why is it not uh, a complete set of operations? Well, that's what I, we do later, but what is the significance of not being able to, to permute? I mean, why, is that, why, do we, why do we care about permuting? Yes, you can't even add x1 and x2. So x1 is stuck in the first slot, x2 is stuck in the second slot. And so far, we don't know how to get different slots, uh, different indices in the array to interact. Okay, addition and multiplication are just component-wise. Right. So, all right, but what if we add permute? So that, that actually helps a lot. So we want to, you know, add x1 and x2 and x3 and x4. And we have this data that's stuck up in the, uh, in the blocks. 
So how can we get them to interact? Well, first I'm going to kind of select the, the data that I care about, you know. So um, for this particular operation, I don't care about X5 and X7. Uh, so I'm just going to extract out the X1 and the X3, the, the two left inputs to the gates. Okay? And I do that by, you know, just taking this particular vector here and multiplying it by the x's, okay? That, that, and I just put 1's for x1 and x3, and, and so I get that, right? We know how to do an n -mult. Um And I do a similar thing for the right inputs. And then I do a permute to just stick these things in the first two slots. I do a permute here to stick the two right inputs in the first two slots. And now I'm good to go. I just do an addition. Okay. So, yeah. So for, for vectors of data, you need add, mult, and permute. Is that clear? All right. So how do we do that? Uh, this is uh, where the fun begins. Um, of course, you don't, I mean, you want to keep everything packed. That's the whole point of batching, right? You don't want to unpack and then permute everything as singletons and then repack. You want to kind of keep everything in place. And automorphisms, that's uh, as, as Vinny mentioned. So it's the same, same sort of tricks uh, that, he, that he used to get a search to decision reduction for ring on debris. All right, so this is, um, it's pretty simple really. So suppose you have some, some polynomial, A of Y, and you want to uh, just permute its evaluations, right? You know, so A evaluates a certain thing on 2 and a certain thing on 8, but you want a, some other polynomial that evaluates to the same values but in a permuted way. And so the transformation is, is simple. You just replace Y with Y to the I for some i other than 1, or really i has to be relatively prime to 2n to, to get this permutation to work properly. Okay, why does that work? It's, well, okay, you have a, it has some evaluations, and, um, and now what I'm doing with this new polynomial b is, is just the original polynomial a at, evaluated at alpha to the i, but all of these things are, in, these alphas are nth roots of unity, right? Mm -hmm. So when I exponentiate by i, I'm just permuting them. They remain nth roots of unity when I exponentiate them. So it's the same a, uh, you know, uh, uh, evaluated, uh, 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 permuted uh, alphas. What's a shift? Uh, okay, yeah. Every shift is. Uh, well. Uh, I mean, a shift is a is a kind of permutation, right? I mean, so. It's in, it's in terms of the number of operations. Like, obviously, I can zero everything and then leave just except for one. You're asking about. You're saying I have a really complicated permutation, this and this is not going to do it. Right. Yeah, not, not yet. Right now, the, the, yeah, the type of operations are, are like, they're, they're not all like this, um, but I think in the particular case of n being a uh, power of 2, which is, you know, kind of the most interesting case, I, 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 I'm not sure, but uh, yeah, I think it's just it's like a shift. You're just rotating. It's one cycle. You can have, uh, you can have rings where it, it does... Um, Actually, yeah, Vadim's ring. It was like it was like two pairs switching. So maybe I'm, I'm wrong, and it's not a it's not a cycle. Huh? There will only be n different permutations. Yeah, there are only n different permutations, and uh, depending on the ring, they can they can be a cycle, or uh, some some smaller cycles. Okay, so this new polynomial has exactly the same evaluations that A does, but permuted. Yes. Yes. Basically, it has to do with these i's being relatively prime 
it's invertible, so if you want to go back to the original polynomial A from B, you take the inverse I modulo 2N. Why, what? I don't know how to do any other permutations yet. I mean, this, I mean, the automorphisms give me a basic set of n permutations out of the n factorial total permutations. This is all, well, I haven't even, I haven't even told you how we do this on encrypted data. But I'm hoping that we'll be able to extend this idea to work on, on encrypted data and we'll get basic permutations in encrypted data. And then I'm hoping we can do some other tricks to build complicated permutations out of the basic permutations. Oh, well, okay. I'm, okay. If you view it as trivial, then. Um, no. Nice. Yeah, so I want to do it very efficiently. Yeah. Okay. So how do we? So I was just talking in the abstract about polynomials. How do we apply the, uh, this to uh, homomorphic encryption? So what do ring LWE ciphertexts look like? I mean, they're you know a ciphertext is a linear uh, polynomial, and so it's kind of you know the coefficients are kind of polynomials in Y. And then, you know, there's a next term. And uh, what happens is that uh, uh, it should be the case, you know, if it decrypts correctly that you have, uh, that, that this formula uh, occurs, okay? Where E is some, you know, smallish uh, polynomial, okay? So here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to replace Y with Y to the I everywhere. Okay, so this, this, this is kind of a trivial step. I'm just writing y to the i where there was a y before. So, of course, the equation should hold because, you know, I'm just replacing. Um, so, uh, okay. So, and I even write y to the i here, right? So, this, this equation only holds, so far, um, modulo this kind of bigger degree polynomial, which is a little weird. Um, but, you know, these eyes, um, yeah, these eyes have to be odd, okay? I mean, they have to be uh, invertible, modulo 2 to the n. Those are the only eyes that we're playing with. And so y to the n plus 1 divides that, so we, we can go back to this, uh, this um, smaller ring. Okay, so we have this, um, this, this, this new equation that, um, you know, it looks like a, sort of a normal decryption um, Operation except it has these y to the i's in them, but you know, so but we can just view this, okay, so this is our new ciphertext. Okay? And we reduce it modulo y to the n plus one, you know, it, it you know some of the increases some of the powers and you have to reduce, reduce them back. Okay, but if we look at the ciphertext, it's 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 an encryption of the original message about you know at uh, m to the uh, at y to the y to the i under this kind of strange secret key, which it has a y to the i in it. So, okay, so, so don't look, no looking. So what, what are we going to do next? So suppose we want, uh, so we have a ciphertext under a weird key. What if we just want to go back to having a ciphertext under the original key, s at y? You know, just so that we can add it to some other ciphertext that's under, you know, if we have cipher, uh, ciphertext under all sorts of different keys, we can't really easily get them to interact, right? If they're the, under the same key, then we can add them homomorphically. So suppose we want to do an addition operation with some other ciphertext that's at, you know, under key S of Y. What are we, how are we going to, how are we going to get this ciphertext to be uh, back under S of Y? Key switching, yes, yes. So, um, so key switching, which is, you know, was used in 
A different context is, is uh, before is very useful here. Um, I mean, I, I told you before that you have, uh, you, if you want to switch from one key to another, you can do it. You just have to put some auxiliary information in the public key, key that allows you to do this transformation. You can switch from one key to another. So if I want to switch back, uh, oh, I want to do the opposite of that, I guess. Um, uh, to the original key, I can do it. I just have to set up the auxiliary information in the public key that allows me to do that kind of proxy re-encryption key switch step. Okay? And th huh? Uh, well, of course they're related because it was originally under key S. So what's the problem? So you're worried that the auxiliary information will reveal something more. Um, okay, that's, you know, that's a really good question, actually. Um, so what you actually want to do here is you don't want to switch back to the original key. You want to set up some other key, T, where you switch both of, of the, uh, the things to key T. And then you don't have the circular security issue. Okay, so, so, that, so any questions? So, I mean, we've, um, th through the miracle of key switching, we're able to actually permute the data within the array. Just the basic permutation so far. Okay, which, which permutations are these? Um, well, there's fun with Galois groups. I, you know, I don't know a whole lot about Galois groups. Um, but so I mean, so the simplest case is that sometimes it's cyclic. Just just think of it as being cyclic, some sort of cyclic rotation of the data in the plain text slots. Okay, and, and you can get rings that are like that. So I won't go into Galois theory or anything like that. Just be aware that there are different basic permutations that have more complicated structure, and you can do all the tricks that we do here out of the cyclic basic rotations with these other weird uh, permutations. So I'm going to make the claim that for every permutation uh, uh, pi, we can take our, uh, we, we can construct, a, you know, an operation that realizes that permutation efficiently uh, from addition, multiplication on, on the arrays and this rotate operation that we have. Okay, and once we have a general permutation, that's, uh, uh, that's pretty, I mean, then we can do, that's, you know, then we have a complete set of operations on encrypted arrays. We're good to go. So we just need to show this. Okay, butterfly networks. Um, butterfly network is, is how you, uh, uh, you know, if you want to permute n items where n is 2 to the k, you can construct this network that has n inputs and it has 2k minus 1 levels, so a logarithmic number of levels. And basically what happens in the butterfly network if you have, you know, 128 items is that at the first level you swap or not like the first and 65th items, the, the second and 66th items, the items that are distant 64 away from each other, you know, since there are 128 items. On the second level, you switch or not. You have little toggles that t tell you whether you switch this pair or not at, at, at each, for each pair. But at the second level, you switch uh, items that are distance 32 from each other, and then 16, and then 8, 4, 1, or 2, 1, <laughs> and, then, and then you go back up, 2, 4, all the way back up to uh, 64. So that's why you have 2K minus 1 levels. Okay, and so like I said, each each level is some sort of massive parallel swap operation, and the information you give the swap operation is you know has to know its level because it has to know what the pairs that it's considering swapping are, and it has to have some string where for each pair you say whether you're switching them or not. Okay, so so you have you know so you have. Uh, uh, this index i here, and you have a string of length, you know, n over 2 that tells you whether you're swapping each pair. Okay, so that. Um, and then it swaps if that's a 1. Okay, so let me give you um, 
how we're actually going to, uh, I'll, I'll actually do a permutation on these things. Um, well, this is just the swap operation. So I'm not really going to go through the whole butterfly network. I'm just going to tell you how to do a swap. And then, you know, then you construct the butterfly network for the full permutation uh, out of these swaps. Okay, so, so let's ju just do this uh, swap here. So, so what the input is, is I'm saying that I'm at level two. So at level one, I swap things that are four apart. Level two, I swap things that are two apart. So, um, and it, it's actually more specific. The, 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 um, so the, the, the pairs, like one and three, are the same except for the second bit. Th those are exactly the ones that I, I consider switching. The, the, when you write them in, in, as, in, as their binary, uh, in their binary representation, they're exactly the same except in that, that one bit. Okay. So for, for, for this example, these are the pairs that we're considering switching. And by the 0, 1, 1, 0, zero here, I'm saying that I'm not going to actually do this first swap. I am going to do this swap. swap. I am going to do that swap. I'm not going to do that swap. Okay? So those are the actual swaps that I want to do. So, okay, so but I have this rotate operation. How do I do a swap operation out of a rotate operation? Anyone, to, anyone want to expound? I don't have a really specific question here, but what, 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 uh, what's, what sort of a neat property of the uh, butterfly network that we can take advantage of inside each level of swap that, uh, that makes it kind of similar to our rotation. The distances are all, this, all the same. Like in the swap operations, the distance between the two items in each pair is always the same at a particular level. That's kind of like a rotate operation, you know, so you just rotate by that amount. The swap is a little more complicated because you can go to the left, you can go to the right. And so what I do is I use the rotate operation twice, one to the left and one to the right. So since I'm uh, switching things that are two apart, I, I rotate these things by two to the right, and I ro rotate them by two to the left. And now I know, I know for each column, so I want a four here, right? I know that it's going to be here somewhere, you know, because it either, stays in, it either stays in place or there's something that comes in from the left or something that comes in from the right. And so I know it's going to be one of these, uh, these entries here. Okay? And so, and so these are the actual items that I, I want to output. I want to output one, four, three, you know, that's the sequence of things that I want to output. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so basically I, I don't know what the particular data is. I mean, it's certainly not one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. But I, I mean, I know the permutation that I'm actually implementing. So I know how to set the switches in the, in the swap network, right? Okay, to get the, you know, to, to make the permutation do what I want. And, and so I know, I know that in these positions, the data was already correct, in the correct position. Okay, so I don't want to take it from here or here. I want to take it from the first place where it was, where it was correct. Okay, and so I express this by putting ones in all the places where the data is already correct and zeros uh, where it's not. And then I do a multiplication operation and I just get the, uh, the data that I want. And I just do a similar thing uh, on the other arrays. So I know that this is, you know, I want that slot from, from this, uh, this array. Uh, so I'm going to multiply this and, and extract the stuff that I want. Okay? And now I just do an addition operation and I get the array that I want. So, so overall, uh, I just, you can do this, uh, I've constructed, uh, I mean, I, you know, I haven't shown you the full details, but I've shown you how to construct an arbitrary permutation. What you do is you take a bu the butterfly network for it, 
and the, and the toggles, toggles of all the switches inside the butterfly network. And using that and uh, using the basic uh, permutations, bas the rotations, and using the addition of the molt to extract out the data that we want, uh, you can realize an arbitrary permutation. And it's pretty efficient because it's a butterfly network. It only has a logarithmic number of levels. So you do this a logarithmic uh, number of times. It's, uh, it's not too bad. So, um, yeah, so the bottom line is that if you, if you use this in connection with the BGV scheme, you get something that's, uh, that's really efficient. You could take the cipher text, so, you know, so you have your moduli, they're a certain size, and you have your plain text P, you know, number P, which is a certain size. And so you can, you know, in each slot, you, you know, the ratio of, of cipher text to plain text is like, you know, log Q over log P. And, you know, that ratio is whatever it is, but it's, a, you know, it's not, um, you know, it's not too bad in the BGV scheme where we get to keep the Q relatively small. I mean, it depends on the depth we want to evaluate. It's exponential in the depth. Um, so, so what you get is a scheme where the, you know, uh, the overhead is, is really related to this log Q over log P. It's not related to the lattice dimension anymore because we have lots of plain text spaces, you know, equal to the number of, uh, to the lattice dimension. Okay. And so you have, you know, so that's, you know, so you have some logs and you have some poly logs, you know, you know, from the, the butterfly network. And, uh, so, um, but overall you get this, I mean, it's also poly, uh, you know, related to the logarithmic of the width of the circuit that you want to evaluate. I, I didn't really get into this. I just described how you do a permutation within a block of n items where n is the dimension of the lattice. What if you have a really complicated circuit with levels and wiring in between the levels where you want to do a really complicated permutation across the entire width of a really wide circuit? You have to build a permutation out of these, these smaller permutations. Uh, and you can do that. I didn't describe that. Um, but that's why the log W is there, um, you know, just because the, the butterfly network depth will depend on the width of the circuit. So that's, I mean, so it's great news that FHE is efficient now. So it's a, it's a polylog. It's a really big polylog, unfortunately. <laughs> okay, so maybe take a break.